My name is Yolande Howard, and prayer for me has always been my communication with God. He's always interceding, and He will give you as much as you can take. But you have to be willing. You have to be open. You have to give yourself to Him wholly. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to pray. Your daughter, Sherry Harney, has said it best. We don't have to pray. We get to pray, Lord. And it is such an honor to get to pray for your protection, for your salvation, for our churches and our families, and for your will, God and your plan for our lives and this service today. Pour out an extra blessing, Lord, over Pastor Kevin and Sherry Harney today to reach us with your word and knowledge to draw closer to you in prayer. Bless this entire Shoreline congregation to go beyond our own expectation in reaching sisters and brothers for Christ. Holy God, bless our prayer partners our prayer warriors to go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit to minister to those who need it most. Grow us in our prayer ministry and wisdom with a greater understanding of what it means to pray and to pray for others. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. I didn't see it coming, just minding my own business, sitting in my chair in the morning, reading my Bible, having a little prayer time, kind of starting my day off, and all of a sudden, kind of out of nowhere, this person comes to my heart and my mind, Dan Webster. He, he was my youth pastor over 15 years earlier, but all of a sudden, he's there on my heart, and he's on my mind, and so I, I just kind of paused in, in my devotional time in the morning. I just prayed for him, prayed for his wife and his family, and Went on about my day. The next morning, I'm sitting, kind of getting ready to read my Bible and pray, and all of a sudden, just kind of out of nowhere, Dan Webster's there again. And I hadn't thought about him for a number of months except for the day before, and, but I'm like, okay, I prayed for him again. Third day happens again. So at this point, I, the first two times, I kind of prayed with my eyes open, just prayed for God's blessing on him and his family. But this time, I started to pray with my ears open. I said, okay, God, I prayed for Dan the last couple of days. Is there something else? Is there a reason he's coming to my heart? And I didn't hear anything with my ears, but in my heart, I just felt like, encourage him. Be encouraged. So I got up from my seat where I was having my Bible study. I went over to my desk. I sat down. I got out a card, and I just wrote a personal note to him, a handwritten note, and I, and I said, Dan, I need you to know that more than a decade and a half ago, your ministry and your life so impacted me. Your teaching helped me come to know Jesus. And, you, and he was the first one who said to me, I think you should be a teacher, and you might be a preacher someday. And I said, that's what I'm doing right now with my life. And I just thank, I just I thank God for you, for how God used you in my life. A little later in the day, I dropped that in the mailbox, sent it off, and I kind of forgot about it. A week later, I get a note back from him. I open the note. He says, you have no idea the perfect timing of that note you sent to me. I'm kind of in a low point of my ministry, and I'm looking at my life saying, have I made a difference? Has God really used me to impact lives? And I'm just kind of struggling. He says, when I got your note, it was like God said to me, Dan, keep going. You're doing a great job. I had no idea, but God knew. And this is the journey of prayer, praying with our hearts open, our lives open, our eyes open, our ears open, talking with God, responding to God. And, and so today, as, as we draw near to the end of this, this four-week series, I want to invite you, we want to invite you together to take that next step, to go deeper in prayer. If we finish this four-week series, you go, oh, yeah, I remember that four-week series on prayer. That was interesting. What's next? No, it's, it's, Lord, change us. Teach us to pray more than we've ever prayed before with greater passion and power than we've ever prayed. And so I want to remind you today, and if you're a note taker, you can write this down in your notes, we are called to pray for each other. God calls us to be praying for one another. And, and, and intentional about that and focused on that. James says it this way in James chapter 5, verse 16. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful 
and effective. I love those two words. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And you say, well, I'm not you know, a righteous person. I don't know if I'm a righteous person. If you've come to the cross and accepted Jesus, you've been made righteous through his righteousness. And God hears you and responds to your prayers. And there's power and effect in your prayers. As I was thinking about that, I was thinking about the 14 years that Sherry and I served a church in Michigan. And there was this group of people, it was mostly women, this group of people who just, they prayed for me and Sherry and our family every single day. And here's, here's, here's some of their names. I was thinking about Emma Jean Burgess, Dorothy Rosine, Catherine Post, Lucille Patmos. There was others, but those four prayer warriors. Two of them are with Jesus now. Two of them are still part of that congregation, and they still pray for us and our family every single day. But I can tell you, I absolutely believe this, that one day when I see Jesus face to face, when this life ends, I'll be able to look back through my life and see all these different times where I was protected because of the prayers of these, these women. Where our family is a different family because of their prayers. Our children are walking with Jesus a lot, because, not just because of our parenting, but because of their prayers. I think I'll see things, pitfalls I could have fallen into that I didn't because of their prayers. I believe in the power of prayer. And we are called to pray for each other. Think about how Jesus taught the disciples to pray. In Matthew chapter 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Prayer. Have you ever noticed that the Lord's Prayer is not a prayer to pray in the singular? It's a prayer to pray in the plural. Has that ever struck you? Listen to these words. Jesus said, pray like this. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's us language. I'm not just praying for me. I'm praying for us, for God's people. And, and that, that's an amazing lesson in prayer. We have to pray bigger prayers and prayers that span God's family. What do we pray for? Well, right here in, in the Lord's Prayer, we pray for basic provision. Lord, give us our daily bread. It's, it's not a prayer necessarily for all the, all the trinkets and the toys and every single thing we could ever want, but Lord, give us bread for the day. Give us what we need. Are you praying that for other Christians? Provide for them. Watch out for them. Take care of them. Forgiveness. God, help us know that we're forgiven, but also help us to forgive others. I pray that for myself, but, but I, I pray that for you. God, help them forgive whoever's wronged them. I pray that for you. Help them forgive whoever's wronged them. I don't know who it is, but I know we've all been wronged, and we all need to learn to forgive. We're praying for us, God's people. Protection from temptation and the tempter. Oh, do we need to pray this? The enemy is real. The enemy is at work. And oh, God, protect my children from the enticements of the enemy. Lord, protect the young people at Shoreline Church from the enticements of the enemy. Lord, protect the older people at Shoreline Church from the enticements of the enemy. Let's pray protection over the lives of the people who are part of the body of Christ. And, and, and then, as we learn to pray, what should we pray for one another as we walk through a normal, just in a normal day? And we want to just think today about what are those things that can propel us outward in prayer? Here's one, healing. James says, pray for healing. Do you pray for healing for people? I, I, I can stand here and tell you this. I have seen God heal. I've seen relationships that were so fractured and broken that no human being could have put them back together, and I've seen God heal relationships. I've seen bodies that were sick and broken and miraculous healing of God. I've seen people that were emotionally so devastated, it seemed hopeless from a human standpoint, and I've seen God heal. Spiritual brokenness healed by the touch of God. Do you pray, oh God, heal? But listen closely. Here's what we don't do as, as biblical Christians. We don't raise a fist and say, God, you have to heal. You must heal. I'm commanding you to heal. That, that, that's not biblical prayer. We come humbly and say, God, you are all powerful. You can do all things, and you have the power to heal. So I boldly, in the name of Jesus, I humbly but boldly ask you to heal this circumstance, this person, this body, whatever it is. And then we say, and oh God, I trust you, and I will worship you, and I will walk with you, and give you glory if you choose to heal them immediately or later or if for some reason in my eyes I don't even see the healing happen, I will still love you. That's biblical prayer for healing. Boldness, courage, we ask, but we trust God who's on the throne to know what is best to do. And then we need to pray for protection in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. 
But praying in his name isn't just tagging the words in the name of Jesus at the end of any of my prayers. Praying in the name of Jesus is praying in the authority of Jesus and the way that Jesus would pray. And so do you pray, oh God, protect our church. Oh God, protect our pastors and our leaders and our directors. Oh God, protect my children and my grandchildren. Are you praying for the protection of God in the name, in the authority of Jesus? We should begin to pray for spiritual growth and maturity. In children and in us, God, will you help us grow? Help us to to not be content staying the way we are, but become more mature in faith and more committed to Jesus and to love your word more and to walk more closely with you. Are you praying that for the next generation? You know, we we pray, oh God, make my daughter or son or, or, or my granddaughter or my grandson a great athlete. We pray, make them a great student. Do we pray, make them a great woman of God or man of God? I think we we pray so much for other things, we forget to pray for godliness in the next generation. And then praying for the generations to come. I have a friend, Ken Corver. He grew up with a dad who's a pastor. Two of his brothers are pastors. They have a whole legacy of family faith. So he watched parents who prayed for him and grandparents who prayed for him. I didn't have that. My parents never prayed for me. They didn't believe in God. I don't have that family history of prayer for the next generation. But I was praying with, with Ken Corver one day. This was a few years ago. Our, our first son uh, was married. Our next two sons were not married. And our first son, they weren't even talking about having kids. But Ken starts to pray for me. And he prays for me and Sherry. And then he begins to pray for our sons. And then he begins to pray for our grandchildren. I never thought to pray for grandchildren. He started praying for their lives to honor Jesus, for them to walk with God. And something inside of me just melted. I thought, I need to learn to pray for generations beyond where I stand today. And Ken's example has has inspired me to pray. Our hope and prayer is that you will discover what it means to pray with your eyes open, your ears open, your heart open, and your life open, praying more in the power of Jesus. In the book of Acts, we have recorded for us the beginning of the Christian church. We can actually see how the first Christians lived out their faith with each other. We find out that they prayed for and with each other in the normal part of their lives, praying with their lives wide open. When we pray together, we are being the church. A quick survey of the first church paints a clear picture of people praying throughout their day. In 20 of the 28 chapters in the book of Acts, there are multiple references to God's people praying. This was part of the way they did life as Christians. Just to cite a few, it starts in the first chapter of Acts. Chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, it says that the followers of Jesus all join together constantly in prayer. We have that continual prayer phrase again. The early church, what did they do? They were constantly in prayer. Prayer. In the second chapter, it tells us that they were a people devoted to prayer, that constant prayer as part of their life. In Acts 4, there were prayers of praise and cries for help. In verse 24, it says they raised their voices together in prayer to God, in praise of him being over all things. Then further in Acts 4, verse 30, it says that they lifted up prayers for healing through the name of Jesus. There was power in the name of Jesus. And then listen what happens in chapter 4, verse 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And then my last reference is found in Acts 16, verses 25 through 26. They were prayers prayed in crisis. Mm -hmm. Paul and Silas are in jail, and it says that they were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Note what they were doing before that happened. They were praying and singing hymns. When we pray together, God unleashes his 
power. Heavenly power is unleashed when God's people open up their eyes, they see a need, and they pray. I've learned through the years about the kind of power that comes through prayer. When I was a senior in college, I lived with five other roommates, all engaged or soon to be engaged. So the conversations around our apartment every night were about relationships and were about wedding planning. Whether it was a fall versus a Christmas wedding, what color the bridesmaids' dresses were going to be, and the list goes on and on. Now, I was very happy for all my roommates, but it was difficult for me because there was no one in my life and no vision of someone coming in the future. And so at night, and we had two bedrooms, and the bedroom I was in had four of us, and we had two bunk beds. I was in the bottom, and I remembered time after time, the middle of conversations, just turning my head to the wall because the tears would just come down. I didn't want to ruin their joy. I was happy for them. But my sadness for my situation was growing. After a few weeks of this, I went to a godly friend And I said, Maria, I'm really struggling. I'm happy for my friends, but I've got to make it a whole school year. And and she said, you know what, Sherry? We're going to spend some time praying. But, and she gave me some amazing advice. She says, but when you leave, this is what I want you to do. Every single time that you feel a sadness, I want you just to pray. And I want you to pray for who God has for you. Even though you don't know his name, but I want you to do that. And so I did that. I did that for months. I prayed hundreds of times for a person, a man that had no name, no face, but I just kept coming to God and saying, God, I need to trust you. I believe this is a desire of my heart that you've given to me, and I need to have faith. Well, eight months later, I graduated from college, went out to California to work for a summer job with the intention of coming back to Michigan to teach. First week I was there, uh, we had our first meeting, and there was a group from the Crystal Cathedral coming in to meet with us. As they entered into the room, my eye caught one young man. And um, I was, I, my response was in my heart, I felt like, God, is gonna do something. I need to pray for this guy. Now, two things were going on in my head. I didn't know his name, and I also was trying to figure out how old he was, because I was 21, and he looked like he was 16 or 17. (laughs) And so I'm like, I know, God, you're putting him on my heart, but I gotta make sure, I gotta check the spirit here, because if he's 16, then I'm probably a little off on this one. So I maneuvered after the meeting. I don't even know how I did it, but I found my way to him, and I found out his name was Kevin Harney, and I found out he was 19, and I'm like, yes, I can start praying for you now. (laughs) So three weeks went by. All I know is his name and his age. Three weeks go by. I pray for this guy, Kevin Harney, every day, that if God, if this is something you're doing, then Lord, you do the rest of the work. Well, you know the end of the story. I don't have a lot of time to tell you the crazy details and how God worked in a very short amount of time. But within about three weeks after we met, we knew without a doubt that God had called us to marry at some point in the future. God was so good. When I tell that story, I don't say it was love at first sight. I say it was the power of prayer that made me aware that when I saw him, something stirred in my heart, and I knew that I needed to continue the prayer, which I still do to this day, every day, praying for him. Here's what I believe. I believe something happens every single time we pray. Now, that doesn't mean it always ends up the way we think, but I believe God is moving. And our timing may be off, there's other things, but. When we're praying, we're coming before God, asking for his power to lead us. You see, prayer brings God, and God brings power, because God is unbounded power. Could it be that we don't experience all of God's power because we haven't prayed? I think that can can happen. 
Do you have an area of discouragement or frustration or sorrow or a hope that is, is still not realized in your life? Maybe today you could walk out of here and do what I did every single time, just exchange kind of the struggle of it and then turn it into prayer. Here's the beauty of praying with your eyes wide open. You can do that any place, any time, in any circumstance. You can do what I did. Dallas Willard spoke these words that transformed my understanding of prayer and God's power. He said this, learning to pray in the power of God is the primary place that we learn to live with the power that God gives us. Dallas taught me that seeking to live in the power of God without prayer can open the door for pride and an inflated view of myself. It's too easy for us to begin giving ourselves credit. And so I believe God uses prayer to make sure that he stays first in our life. When we pray in power and we trust God, he answers those prayers. And when they, those prayers gets an, get answered, we look back and we give God the glory. We don't look at ourselves. And then God has his rightful place in our life, and then he can entrust us with more of his power. I believe that's how prayer can work. To experience more of God's power, we must pray. So while Sherry's praying hundreds and hundreds of times for me, I'm not praying for her. <laughs> I, um, I hadn't matter. met her, um, and that wasn't where my, I was a Christian, but that wasn't where my heart was at. That was her journey. But in the same way that her prayer impacted her and prepared her to have something happen when she saw me, I have no question that God was answering her prayers and doing something in me. Because that day, when we had that meeting, and they had the staff of Laurel Pines Camp up on the stage, and they introduced one staff person after another, when they introduced Sherry Vleem, I leaned to my buddy Rick next to me, I nudged him and I said, Rick, this is really weird. I feel like I'm going to marry that woman. I did. And it wasn't like every cute blonde I saw, I'm like, I'm going to marry that woman. Um, I, I, had, I, had never, I had never had that happen before. Even people I dated, I hadn't had that happen. But it, and I'm absolutely convinced that that was the work of the Holy Spirit of God preparing us. Because we had a couple weeks till she was going to move to California, I was going to move to Chicago, and we were going to be apart for a year. So something had to happen fast. And, that, that, and so thank you for all those prayers. Yeah, I, I believe My that pleasure. prayer makes a difference. My pleasure. Yeah, good, thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm, not, I'm sorry I forgot to pray for you then too. Um, so that's not in my notes, but uh, um, I want to give some simple reminders about praying with a life wide open. I, wanna, I want us to go from here. We want us to go from here, not just saying we learned about prayer, but praying more than we've ever prayed before with greater passion than we've ever had before and seeing greater power of God than we've ever seen before. And so some reminders to keep in your heart and your mind. First, prayer propels us out with the good news of Jesus. You start praying more, you will start to share the love of Jesus more. Because when you pray, you connect with God, and God loves this crazy, broken world. And Jesus came for lost and broken people like us and like others. And so you start praying, you're going to see yourself going out with God's love in new, fresh ways. I challenge you to pray for people in places of authority. We, we have stopped, I believe, as a church, praying for local leaders, state leaders, national leaders, international leaders. When the apostle Paul wrote, pray for those in governing, places of governing authority, there were people in governing authority that were persecuting Christians. And he said, still pray for them. God doesn't say pray for people in places of authority if you agree with them, because here's the fact, then you'll never pray with, for anybody, because you don't always agree with everybody on anything, including yourself. Have you ever found you disagree with yourself? Like, I used to think this, but now I think that. It, and so, so... Pray for people. I may, I may disagree with them. There's, you're going to have somebody on the other side of the aisle from you at all times in some kind of place of authority, but God's not saying you have to agree with them, but pray for the power of God. Pray for the truth of God to break through. Pray for the conviction of God to be there if it needs to, but pray in power for people in places of authority. Pray for people who are far from Jesus. You have people in your life that don't yet know Jesus. Pray that they would draw near and see his love and grace. Some of you have people in your life who used to walk really close with Jesus. And they've wandered. 
Just keep praying them back and praying them back. It's those hundreds of prayers. But God is doing something every time you pray. Pray for the church and for church leaders. I would ask you to pray for Shoreline's pastors and directors and staff members. If you go on our, I challenge you once a month, go on the church website and click on staff and find a couple of people on the staff that you know and pray for them and find a couple of people that you don't even know who they are. And if you click on their name, it's going to open up a little bio, a little description of them and say, oh, that's, so you saw Yolanda up on the screen here. She's one of our admins and she led in prayer this morning. And you find out what Yolanda does and pray for God's blessing in her ministry here at Shoreline Church. But pray for our staff, pray for our church, pray for our family members, for God's protection over our families. Pray for your enemies. Say, pray for your enemies? Yeah, Jesus was clear about this. Those who persecute you and those who are your enemies, pray for them. But I just want to pray for people I like. It doesn't work that way. Pray for people who, who you feel are rivaled against you, but pray for God's truth and God's light and God's presence and God's power. And I want to give you just a few, a few, this is kind of a lightning round, so if you're a note taker, get ready to write these things down. But prayer prompters throughout your day. How do you just kind of pray more and more through the day? Here's just some quick things to think about. How about this? When there's great joy and celebration, when it's just a great moment, stop and just don't go, oh, this is great. Say, God, this is great. I met yesterday morning to golf with, with two guys, kind of a friend I've had for some time, and then a new friend. And on the first tee, I did what I always do on the first tee when I play golf. I just stood there and I kept my eyes open. I said, God, thank you for this beautiful place. Thank you that our bodies work enough to go out and play this crazy game. Thank you, for, thank you for that we live in a place where there's not snow on the ground or, you know, and there's going to be other places. Just thank, thank, and just thank God for those good things. When there's loss and pain and sorrow, in those hard times, talk with God. God, I'm hurting. God, I need your grace. I need your presence. When you see a church, every time you drive by another church, pray for God's blessing, for God's work. If it's a church that's wandered from the gospel, pray them back to the gospel of Jesus. Pray when there's conflict in the air. When there's tension and conflict, just in your own heart, Lord, help me. Lord, give me patience. Lord, help me stay strong through this. Pray when the future is uncertain. Like Sherry prayed for eight months. When all her friends are rejoicing and she's sorrowing, but she kept praying, God, you know the future. Prepare me for that. Pray at meals. Christians used to pray at meals. We don't so much anymore. That's a chance to pray three times a day or seven times a day if you're a hobbit. Uh, and so, but, it's, but just you know, pray, pray, pray before every meal. God, thank you for this food. Provide for my body. Take care of me and pray. How about this? Pray when you brush your teeth or when you floss. I mean, some of you will pray once a day. Some of you will pray like 14 times a day. But, but pray every time you're doing personal hygiene with your mouth and say, God, let my words be a blessing. Keep me from gossiping. Let me speak words of kindness and pray for your words as you brush your teeth or as you floss. When you're doing the laundry, when you're watering the flowers, when you're walking the dog, the point is this. Pray at all times, in all places, with eyes open, eyes closed, a heart and life open to Jesus. And just some more simple reminders about praying with a life wide open. First, to remember that we pray because God answers. In John 14, 13, it says... Jesus is speaking. He says, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Just three biblical guidelines thinking about what this, these verses say. One, that God invites you to ask. So go ahead and pray. Just keep praying. God said, you may ask me for anything in my name, so pray. Two, ask in the name of Jesus, and Kevin spoke about this, in his authority, and I always like to think, is this a prayer that Jesus would pray? Would he pray it like this? That has helped me. And then three, ask so that the Father is glorified. Is the answer of this prayer, would it, would it in some way point to God's character, to his goodness, to his power. How would God be glorified through this prayer? Other, another suggestion for you today from me is to start every day. First thing you do when you get out of bed, just say a quick prayer. I started doing this, oh, 15, uh, 17 years ago. One particular night, I wasn't feeling very good. I was laying in my bed and I was actually listening to a sermon, and so I was going in and out of the sermon. But I actually did catch this. The pastor said, if everybody that is listening to this sermon right now would, in the morning when they wake up and get out of bed, 
get on your knees next to your bed and say a prayer before you went on your day. Think of the impact we could have on the world. Well, I slept through the night. I woke up in, in the morning, and this is absolutely true. I found myself on my knees next to my bed. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, that's right. I remember I heard that. I'm gonna pray. Went throughout my day, didn't think much of it. Next night I go to bed. This is absolutely true. The next morning I wake up, and when I am fully aware of what I've done, I'm here again. Now I'm talking to God. God, this is like a miracle. I don't even know how I got here. It's happened two days in a row. This is amazing. Lord, and began to pray for the day. Went about my day, third day, absolutely true. I woke up in bed. And I remember, I talked to God all the time, and I remember saying, bummer, God. <laughs> I, was, I was like, this was really great what was happening. And I was just kind of thinking, wow, the last couple of days, that was amazing. But now look at it. it's done. It's not happening again. And just in the quietness of the way that God speaks to my heart, I don't hear things audible, but I did hear in my heart, now you choose. I knew. Oh, Lord, yes. I realize I have to make this choice to pray every single day. And I told the Lord then, Lord, I'm going to do my very best to wake up from now on till the day I die and come to see you face to face that I will start my day if I'm physically able on my knees, acknowledging that it's not me who walks. Humbly, Lord, I come and I want your strength today that you would gain glory from this prayer, Lord. I want to challenge you that you'd join with me and choose from this day to start your day praying. It's probably the single thing that has transformed my prayer life because somehow that morning prayer sets me on the trajectory of praying all day. I praise God that that happened to me. Another reminder just to pray for little things. Through the years, if I misplace something or lose something, I just pray. I just pray right away. Lord, can you help me find that? Now, when I started doing this, I was praying a similar prayer often about, Lord, can you help me find my keys? <laughs> I would misplace my keys. You know what? The Lord never miraculously helped me to find it, but, but he did speak to me. You know, it might be good if you found one place where you always put your keys and you don't have to keep praying this prayer. I believe that God answered my prayer. I do have one place now because if I don't, they get, all, they get all over the place. But I do have stories of miraculous answers. I lost my diamond out of my ring and, and there was no way that I was humanly going to find it. But I just asked the Lord, Lord, if you would. I found it in the, in the basement and I was ready to sweep something and I normally used um, the dustpan, but I couldn't find it. And because I had to bend down to sweep in like this, I found something sparkling. It was my diamond. God has done that. And he has been faithful to me either way. But just to go to him first, nothing is too small or mundane to bring before the Lord. And so prayer becomes this great adventure. God, how are you going to answer this? And trusting him. If God knows no limits, neither should our prayers. As we come to God throughout our days, we sense God's presence and his power. As we pray with our eyes, our ears, our hearts, our lives wide open. We grow in our understanding of who God is. You see, God is imminent. And what I mean by this is that we can experience his presence from all he has created. He is very close and always present. And in this, you may want to pray with your eyes wide open and maybe your head lifted acknowledging that he is here. But we also have to remember all of God's character. And God is also transcendent, which means that he is completely different than anything in his creation. That he is over and beyond us. And in that, you may want to 
close your eyes when you pray, to capture how transcendent God is. And so both postures, all postures are appropriate. Years ago, I was overwhelmed with a simple two-word phrase, to pray continually, found in the Bible. And I learned it's not that we have to pray, but it's that we get to. This is a decision that can become a lifestyle. Would you stand with us? I want to close with a word of prayer. And it's been kind of fun since Sherry's been teaching about praying with eyes wide open. And she wrote a book about it. Now people will watch her pray sometimes with their eyes open. And sometimes she closes her eyes because she's focusing on, on God's power and glory. And that helps her to pray. And they'll say, hey, you kept your eyes closed. It's like she's going to get in trouble for it. Uh, but the, but the, the, point is, the point is that we pray at all times and all places and watch what God does. So before we close with our, our closing song, and I invite you to, to just join your heart with me and let's talk to God together. Oh God, thank you that we can pray with our eyes open and Lord, we can pray with our eyes closed. We can pray as we walk along throughout the day, as we drive along. We can pray in all times at all places. Our prayer, oh God, is simply this. May we pray more than we've ever prayed with greater passion than we've ever felt and see greater results and power than we ever dreamed for the glory of Jesus. Now hear our voices as we worship you together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Keep your heart open. Let's worship the Lord together.